Welcome to a radical discussion of independence, free will, liberty, and the left-hand path. This is Damon Ossoff with your host, Paul Frederick. Let's go back to uh, before, prior to the '80s, a little bit. So, Lost Pillars of Enoch, like this book, like takes up a timeline that's like very like early on, and um, this idea of uh, this idea of these two pillars of Enoch that are a survival of knowledge, like from a pre antediluvian, from a pre uh, flood, flood, flood yeah. pre last last apocalypse, if you were a survival of knowledge from like an even much older world that is just beyond all of our uh, current knowledge. Can you talk a little bit about what the quality, what you think the quality of knowledge was um, at that time? Well, I wasn't there, so I can't possibly tell you. I can only tell you what Josephus, who first related this story, uh, was thinking about. He was writing in about uh, about 90 AD, roughly. Um, so about 50, 50 plus years after the crucifixion. Um, and he's writing in Rome. And he says that um, uh, the children of uh, Seth, um, who was Adam's third son, that his Seth's descendants um, became aware that God intended to punish the world either through a flood or through a fire. And so they, got, cottoning onto this knowledge, they put everything they knew on two pillars, one of which could withstand fire and the other water, in the hope that one of them might survive for anyone who might come in the future and say, well, this is what we knew. Uh, this is how far we got. Now, Josephus, meaning the Latin Joseph, Yosef, he was a Jewish historian, a Jewish historian who'd fought in the war against the Romans, by the way. Um, he, uh, he says that one of these pillars still survives in the land of Syriad, which the English translator of Josephus in the 18th century, William Whiston, mistranslated. And he thought he meant Syria. And he identified the pillar with some pillars that were left by the pharaoh Sesostris in Syria. But in fact, Syriad does not mean Syria. It means the Sirius worshipping land, Syriad, which is Egypt or in fact, um, upper northern Ethiopia or today's Sudan. And the Sirius, were, Sirius is the god who uh, and star who controls the flooding of the Nile. So we have a very interesting idea that Josephus believed that this ancient knowledge was preserved on a pillar to his day um, somewhere in Egypt. He didn't like to say the word Egypt because he was Jewish and he, he didn't like the, I, I think there was a kind of, it was a kind of um, way of saying Egypt without saying Egypt because Egypt right. had, uh, there was a, a lot of tension at the time between, between Egyptian civilization and Jewish civilization. And there were a lot of arguments going on in Alexandria about whose books were the oldest. And the Jews said, well, ours are much older. Moses is, you know, he taught you. And Abraham taught the Egyptians their astrology and their science. And the Egyptians, no, no, we had Hermes Trismegistus. He wrote the first books and they're all in the temples. So I think this story of the pillar reflects some of the tensions between Egyptian uh, scholars and Jewish scholars in Alexandria at the time. Now, the story obviously isn't true. I think you can't possibly imagine that there was a time when they put all their knowledge on two pillars. My guess is, as a, on merely rational grounds, is that these the pillar that was being described was probably one connected with the inundation of the Nile, hence the connection with the flood. And there we know that there were pillars put up up the Nile, right up down to down to, I say, to the Sudan. Um, which des described the levels of the Nile, which were always astrologically related because the Egyptian New Year started with the heliacal rising of Sirius, the star Sirius, and that's when the flood would happen. And that was the, the New Year festival in, in Egypt. And I think that's what the actual, uh, actual pillar relate to. But the symbolic so that, value, that, the symbolic value of the story is the point. 
Is that this time is, period of the heliacal rising of Sirius when the, the Nile happened, is that associated with the time period that we refer to as the dog days nowadays? Dog no, days it, it, the dog days, exactly that, because Sirius is the dog star, hence the dog days, exactly okay. that. July, August, yeah. Okay. It's slightly changed over time. I think it was July at the time of Josephus, and I think, I think the period's probably August now, if I remember right. Okay. Um, so... The, the point is the symbolic value of the story. The symbolic value is 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 that from from the point of view I take in the book is that hmm, interesting <laughs> sudden pop sounds. Um, I think the the value the value of the story is is that there was once a time where where scientific knowledge, as we call it, knowledge of the stars, particularly Josephus says this was mostly astronomical knowledge written on this surviving pillar associated with the name Enoch, much later, by the way, um, uh, th that it was astrological knowledge, astronomical knowledge, I think, perfectly happy to say. And that this, that knowledge at that time was completely inseparable from spiritual ideas. And we have seen in Western culture since the 17th century, broadly, science leaving his parent behind mm -hmm. and science has become um, purely engaged in a knowledge of matter and measurable substance mm -hmm. uh, whereas nobody in in the late antique world uh, 2000 years ago would ever dream of doing any science without some reference to what they believe were the spiritual powers which upheld the universe Mm -hmm. And as you probably know, that in Jesus' time, the word for the people, the beings that upheld the cosmos was daimones, daimones, mm -hmm. which is translated generally in English as demons or daimons. But mm -hmm. if you look up in the best dictionaries, you'll find the word daimon is connected to God. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they didn't have this idea that Christian civilization has that 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 a daimon was a um, satanic force. I mean, you have all these stories of Jesus exorcising demons from people's minds. Um, this is this is this is a later, more gnostic view that there is something inherently wrong about the universe that somehow fallen angels have taken over the running of this deficient of a deficient more material universe and mm -hmm. that there is a higher universe beyond the stars which is purely spiritual and and absolutely godlike from which the lower demons have obtained their knowledge and josephus is aware of the story which is told in the book of enoch that at some point after um around, just before these pillars are supposed to have been erected uh these fallen angels for lust of men, uh, sorry, for lust of human women, came down, impregnated the women and produced a race of giants. And you've heard probably of the Nephilim, which a lot of people have uh, speculated in uh, very um, colourful ways, say the least. Uh, Mr. Zechin has <laughs> tried to relate them to the cuneiform texts of Acadia. Right. Um, and the lizard people that came all down. Of, all, all of this all of this stuff yeah i mean it's it's endless but it's all based on a few verses of genesis chapter six and i don't think the verses at all support the incredible amount of speculation been built around them mm -hmm. um these these verses promote speculation because they, in fact they're clearly fragments of a piece that's been heavily edited and don't quite add up as, as a text and i deal with that in the book um, the word and the meaning of the word Nephilim and, and how it recurs later in, in the Bible and, and what it might mean. Um, I don't think one needs to think about extraterrestrials, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, um, people at that age were trying to explain how it was that it, 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 this is, these are speculations which come when there's been a certain development in the, in the human mind. And I think that development of consciousness real consciousness about questioning your religion and philosophizing about it the earliest times we really get it is around 
fifth, sixth century BC, which is very, very recent. And uh, people starting to ask, what do our religious and uh, our cult what do our cultural myths mean? Are they reliable? Mm -hmm. Are they dependable? You have this great movement in Judaism, uh, as it was then, very different to how it is now, saying, oh, but the, 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 the Lord will always be found to be just. And you start getting literature saying, well, is that always true? Do the righteous always prevail? Are the evil always punished? And that's really the beginning of, of I suppose you could say philosophy, uh, mm -hmm. which is the ability to question inherited material. And uh, and of course, since philosophy was less let loose, as it were, in the world, uh, thinking people have never been entirely happy, as as the uh, book of Ecclesiastes said, with much knowledge cometh great sorrow. I'll give you mm -hmm. a quick example of that. If I go and speak to some people at the pub who don't read much and much happier for it, I think, <laughs> don't think very much, hear a story and you hear them talk about current crises. It's it's very comforting because their naivety about what's happening is touching, but mm -hmm. it is naive and it's awful if you know more, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and and. I always remember that very good line Jack Nicholson had in A Few Good Men, the movie A Few Good Men. He says, the general public don't want to know the truth. We mm -hmm. spend our lives keeping it from them. A, mm -hmm. because a because it's too much for them to bear. And secondly, because it, make, it makes a more orderly world if people mm -hmm. don't know too much because they'll only freak out. And it's true. Right. I, think, I think this is true. And I, I also think that rather explains why a lot of religion you know, is you can say very simplistic. And obviously when people go to college and start to question, they start to say, well, oh, it wasn't like that at all. And they get very exercised about whether churches should preach simple doctrines to people. And uh, are they misleading them? Well, in a way, yes, they're misleading them insofar as they're not telling everything that they could tell. But there is a, a strong humanitarian reason for speaking to people on the level to which they're best able to understand. You don't mm -hmm. give you don't give a job a, a complex job to a person who's only really happy doing simple work. Right. We're not a, we're not all intellectually equal, and we're not we don't all have the ability to withstand tremors to our nervous system. Right. Uh, you know, and the trouble with the modern media, back to that thing, is that it spouts all this stuff out like a shotgun of ball pellets hitting all kinds of minds and unfortunately many of them can't understand what it is is being spoken they just yeah. they're either through you know just they're not very intelligent as other people are but they're intelligent in their own way perhaps but you know they, they but the media just shoves it all out mm -hmm. now if you have a proper education system you take people in grades through one level of awareness to another it's 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 really cruel i think to ask people to ask too many questions and you end up of course with immense speculative uh, nonsense on the media uh, uh, the internet about things uh, just like the nephilim or uh, right. lizard people where basically you've had a little bit of knowledge comes into a mind that can't quite grasp it and then here's something else and start to create a picture and they're sort of fascinated by it and they and they want to meet other people who are fascinated by it and they sort of these sort of shadowy worlds start to grow until people are living in a complete fantasy and so yeah. you get the same in politics of course people right. have a fantastic idea of the world now in the old world of course we do you know the old system the majority of people knew practically nothing about what was going on and i think many of them were considerably happier as a result oh yeah no i i i keep thinking about that while we're and this has only gotten worse over the years but um, <laughs> every time there's a global conflict like that everyone you know watches it on 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 tv we have like you know news news channels that just that run 24 7 uh, covering these things. But you think back to like not too long ago in history before that, it was like, well, people had to wait to hear 
Um, and a lot of times people heard word, word of mouth if, if, if such and such army was attacking another army like in, in another country over there and get to them word of mouth. And so the information was was so cold, as it were, that no one really could bother to speculate what's going to happen next other than, well, do I need to get out of here? You know, but it's just mm. accelerated so ma- so much. There's so, such a overabundance of, of information that uh, information starts to lose its um, lose its value. Um, you, you, I, are you familiar with um, uh, ro- the writings of Robert Anton Wilson? And, sure, uh, I, me- I, I, I met so- him. I met him in Berlin in, in nineteen uh, last time, nineteen eighty seven. I met him in Berlin. He was talking, giving talks to German enthusiasts of the um, of the tri- the Illuminatus trilogy. And okay. uh, I had some I had some inter- uh, words with him. Mm. That's awesome. So so my my point was just going to be uh, in somewhere uh, one of his books he wrote about or he presented an equation of like of uh, great you know societal uh, inventions from like the wheel and then how many thousands of years before the next thing that and then the next thing and then the next thing and how it gets less and less every time. So eventually, yeah, yeah. It's just gonna implode on itself. And the information uh, is is accelerating faster than than human beings can absorb information. And what is that going to turn us into? And I think a uh, nervous nervous that- Rex is the answer. <laughs> What's that? Nervous Rex is the answer. That's what it's going to turn us into. I'm already. I mean, I I I'm 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 as uh, vulnerable to this deluge. It's a new kind of flood, isn't it? You had the flood of water, you've got a flood of fire. Maybe the new flood, the real destructive flood, is information. Ah, now that's a very good insight there. I like that. Yeah. The new deluge. So so now I have to pivot and say, what what was it like when you met uh, Robert Anton Wilson? Do you have any uh, any funny anecdotes from that? Well, not really. I mean, I, was, I, I think I just made a film about... Uh, about the Rosicrucian movement of the 17th century, which had been made for Dutch television. And um, I, I took it to Berlin to show to a friend of mine who ran a shop of science, a science fiction bookshop in Kreuzberg. And I met some people there and he said, oh, Anton Wilson's giving his talk. So I said, oh, yes, I know his stuff. Um, I said, it's all Ren Le Chateau mixture of, of uh, neo-Gnostic mythology. Mm-hmm. And so I went to see him and I, I listened to the talk he gave. And I, I'll be honest with you, I thought he was, I had the feeling he was one of these Americans who goes to Europe and becomes very loud. Partly, <laughs> you part, mean, just, you mean an American? <laughs> I can't say that. <laughs> I like Americans. Um all the one, nearly everybody I've met in America has 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 been a credit to to the to the system of of the, of the country. Um, but I I did notice when I lived in Amsterdam that the Americans became much louder when they were among people who didn't speak English. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure it's true of English people too in a way. But uh, he, I had a sort of feeling that he was a bit flippant. Do you know the word, flippant? Is that a word? Uh-huh. America, yeah. He's a bit flimmer, he's very lightweight, and he was he was telling a sort of cyni- a series of cynical statements about the stupidity of human beings, which were all perfectly passable, uh, etc. Uh, but I did, ju- I just got the feeling that he probably got a plane to catch in 40 minutes. He was desperate to get out. That was, you know, he, he, I, can't, I can't say it was very enlightening, uh, to be honest, but I think people just wanted their books signed. I did, I did speak to him a bit about Gnosticism, but I, I can't remember the conversation at all. I'm, I, I think he's, is he still alive? I, I hope so. Um, no, he passed away. He passed away. I want to say about 10 years ago. He, oh, really? He did. Yeah. Yeah. That, okay. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear that, but um, I think his books fill, I'd say they fill the gap. They fill the gap. They made a lot of people aware of certain subjects, especially things like Rosicrucianism and Theosophical Secret Societies. Oh, yeah. But I think he did a disservice insofar as his books were imaginative and fictional, but unfortunately a bit, little bit too powerful. And I think this business about the Illuminati um, uh, was a myth that is a very dangerous myth. A lot of people take it far too literally, far too uh, 
um, well, literally, basically, they take it. it it's, it's a myth. It was a myth developed by Adam Weishaupt in the late 18th century and got out of hand then, which led to Weishaupt's fall. And um, it's really out of it's really out of control now. People really do believe there's this conspiracy, sort of quasi Masonic conspiracy going on of very rich people mixed up with some kind of uh, some kind of very negative form of Gnostic. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A kind of uh, superior superior beings, or they imagine they know more and how to control people and all this sort of stuff. The existence of cadres of conspirators is nothing new. I mean, it's not the Illuminati, it's human beings. The word conspiracy means to, it's from the word conspire, means to whisper. It's people whispering. There's always, this always happens. It happens in the playground at school. Have you heard about that? Have you heard about what he's doing? You know, this is a human behavior. When you present certain people with power, the, inevitably they conspire. That's mm -hmm. what people do. But the idea that there is a great, grand, universal conspiracy, uh, no. Um, unfortunately, because this is tied up with Gnostic ideas, which are, do have a conspiracy theory, because in the Gnostic, the cosmoclastic Gnostics had this idea, which you find in the New Testament, that there are the dark powers that run the universe because they're ignorant of the ultimate God. And they control um, the unenlightened minds. But at least in the Gnostic tradition, if you get gnosis, gnosis, spiritual knowledge, and you're aware that you're a spiritual being, you're with your destiny is is a spiritual one. Mm -hmm. You are you become above the earth. You are above the material. You are you rise above the power of these dark angels, archons, rulers. Now, that's quite positive in its way, but it does carry this, this conspiratorial idea that the world is a vast trick, a trap to trap us. And of course, it's in, it's in our religion, Protestant religion too, that the world is a kind of dangerous trap where Satan's trying to trap us into sin and create more denizens of hell. But this is all mixed up then with politics, and then you've got a real problem because people start, instead of re looking at this as a mythology, they start pointing the finger at individuals. And then I think we're into paranoia. Um, yeah. You know, and, and the whole 60s thing that Martin Luther King's death was tied to, um, to, to Robert Kennedy's death, which was tied to his brother's death, which is tied to John Lennon, blah, blah. And so it goes on, so it goes on. That it's all a vast conspiracy. And you've got that also in the black movement. There's, they've been, for years, there's been a kind of idea that there's a vast conspiracy going mm -hmm. on there. And uh, it may comfort those, as, like all these theories, they give occasional comfort to people who want an, an explanation for it all. Well, there isn't really an explanation for it all. People are just like that. They mm -hmm. always have been. Mm -hmm. You know, they say yeah. power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, what is mostly corrupted when there's a corruption? It's the state of the mind. And if you're going to talk, point the finger at people you think are corrupt, I would say, first of all, examine whether your mind may have been corrupted mm -hmm. in some way. Are you still the lovely, innocent child you once were? Or do you now think you know something? Uh-huh. You know? so, so to me, that's, uh, that's getting into the, the basis of uh, Gnosticism as a personal spiritual, as a spiritual practice, is the first thing I'm going to do with it is use it to try and understand my, my own mind. That has to be the first thing that, uh, that I do with it, because any, any sort of uh, uh, system that, that that starts out with let's figure out what's wrong with everyone else's mind is going to lead me like in a in a in a different in a different kind of direction than than a um, spiritual pursuit or a gnostic pursuit. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is when I think of gnosticism, a word that comes up a lot is the word uh, the demiurge, and especially when you mention this idea of gnosticism as being well, this is actually kind of like one of the first conspiracy theories. It's kind of there's this idea that there was a that that what we're told 
what everyone else thinks is God in in this world is actually not God. It's this demiurge or these or the watchers or you know the fallen angels or something like that. And the real God, the real father or the real source of you know consciousness and spirituality, enlightenment and everything is actually kind of we're kind of separated right now. There's kind of this this barrier between us and him, which is this demiurge, which everyone else thinks is the real guy. Um, is that, what are your thoughts on what I just said there? Is that, is that <laughs> my way off or is it? <laughs> no, 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 no not, not at all. It's just that the, these are vast, vast, vast subjects. Uh, and well, to, you know, I'm to, American. I wanna, I wanna wrap <laughs> it all up and, you know, <laughs> uh, wrap it up and package it and put it on a shelf. <laughs> I, I it's you know it's very strange very strange i i um the last few weeks i've been uh, looking at the connection between the gnostic writings of the second third century uh, commonly called gnostic gospels but they're not all gospels and but also the hermetic tradition and its connection with alchemy and whether alchemy as it's the symbolic alchemy uh, is derived from acquaintance with the Gnostic writings or whether the Gnostic impulse to see the hidden within comes from in fact metallurgy and the art of alchemy which is trying to extract powers from within substances through heating them up and doing various things with them and it is a question I don't think has been asked that way before and I'm fascinated so I started reading yet again the uh, Nag Hammadi library uh -huh. And one thing I found is that, especially this last few weeks with these crises developing, it's very odd this, and this is just purely personal. I get up in the morning and I start reading about five or six o'clock, and I was reading the Gospel of Philip, so-called, and after a certain time reading this, I got very annoyed with it. It wasn't giving me any spiritual insight at all it just seemed a lot of riddles with a fairly simple underlying solution demiurgical this world bad marry your soul to the spiritual world above uh, and this world can go to hell pretty well then and, and I, I i began to get very annoyed now it's a very odd thing i was i was crossing the atlantic in 2012 to come over to new york on the queen mary and we got into some rough seas and I was on my own for the whole trip. It was, you know, a week to cross the Atlantic on the ship. And I got quite scared one night. And, um, you know, there's a lot of noises in the ship and there was nobody to reassure you. <laughs> and you're in the middle of the Atlantic where the Titanic sank, you know. Not quite the middle, but getting on for Newfoundland. You know? Sure. And uh, I, 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 I picked up, uh, there was a Gideon's Bible in the drawer and I picked it up and I, uh, right, and I opened it up and pointed my finger and there was uh, something from the Psalms or something, for I am the Lord of the waves. Oh. oh. That did it. I suddenly thought, cool it, Tobes. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I'm saying is ultimately the spiritual nourishment that counts is the one that reaches where you are right now. Now, there was a point in my life where the Gnostic material really reached me. It seemed to uh, be very powerful um, because of its uncompromising belief in the ultra reality of spirit, spirit and its diminu diminution of, shall we say, substance matter, the created cosmos which is attributed to a secondary uh, power. Now, that secondary power may not be all bad. It depends which Gnostic writing you're acquainted with. Sometimes the Demiurge is called the Son of God. And Isaac Newton believes strongly that the Logos, the Word of God, now I don't mean the word in the ordinary sense of English, the Word of God. Word is a translation of Logos, which in Stoicism, is the principle, intelligible principle of cosmic existence. So in other words, there's always a bit of God in everything, if you like. There is a principle that is much higher than the cosmos itself, but the cosmos is sustained on this principle. Isaac Newton strongly believed that ultimately, the ultimate explanation was gravity, 
ultimate explanation, not the mathematics of it, but the ultimate explanation was that Christ, as he saw it, was as a cosmic power, son of God, sustained the universe in a way which we would never understand. That was Newton's view, Isaac Newton, so-called father of modern science. So it's worth bearing that in mind. Um, I, I, I think the, the trouble with all these myths like the Demiurge is, uh, and, and the subordinate angels is they have a level where they make sense, but they don't make enough sense. I, rem I remember uh, a very good scholar of Gnosticism, dead now, is a professor in St. Andrews in Scotland, said to me, the Gnostics thought very deeply the question I would ask is, did they think deeply enough? <laughs> <laughs> and there, as I get uh, more, um, a little move on a little bit in, in, in my own search for truth, I, 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 I'm more likely to, to, to question uh, this sort of material. It's very worrying when people start taking it too literally and start applying it to real events. It reminds me of the kind of people who used to knock on my door from the Jehovah's Witness, and, and they really genuinely believed that passages in the book of Daniel or Ezekiel referred to the European Union, Union or NATO or the World War II. And I, right. I just say, look, do you know when this was written? Do you know actually in what language it was written? Do you know when it was translated? Do you know, uh, do you actually aware of the history when this book came out in 167 BC? You know, do you know, and, uh, luckily I did because I, <laughs> I'd, I'd wanted to study the subject. And these were just ordinary people who were caught up in this fantasy of biblicism, of the Bible has it all, uh, Daniel 12, 2, uh, Isaiah 24, 7, uh, Mark 2, 17, you know. And then the whole world is based on these, applying these quotes to, to world events. There used to be a magazine in the 70s called The Plain Truth, which was financed by a very wealthy American, and it was sold. Sorry, it wasn't sold. It was given free. Very expensive color magazine, news magazine. Uh, I, I can't imagine who's who's been influenced by it over the years, but I think a lot of the new right will have, have been influenced by this, either through the parents or whatever. But this mag, which is great production, you know, uh, by a very well-meaning American millionaire, or billionaire, now he would be, I suppose. Uh, but basically, he, he was explaining everything happening in the 1970s as a fulfillment of prophecy. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, in my teen years, I read it. And I, I remember setting up a little club at school for studying Apocaly the, book, uh, the book of Revelation in relation to the oil crisis of 73 and the, the Arab-Israeli war, the Yom Kippur war. I said, well, you could look at this passage here. So I, well, I've been through all that stuff. And it's disconcerting to find 50 year, or nearly 50 years later, people going through the same crap again <laughs> with the same result that it won't get you anywhere. Right. It ain't going to, this ain't going to do it. <laughs> right. You know, there isn't a biblical explanation for every event that happens. The, the Bible is a guide for the spirit at its best, a guide for the spirit. It is not a, a handbook or a, how can I say, a rule book in the ordinary sense of the word. It isn't a club where you do this, you do this, it always results. You know? Right. Well, it's, it, it, it can be this, just based on this, the this, historical this. information that we know about how the Bible was put together that, you know, there's like a count, there is a council where they decided, you know, which books are going to go in here and and what, and we know yes, about, yes, you know, yes, arising but, and translating and stuff like that. There's okay, no way. Well, no, okay, Paul, uh, we know all that. We know all that. But the point is we're in danger of creating alternative Bibles, you know, with alternative explanations, which in fact are as, will be ultimately as fallow, uh, as, as hollow rather, as hollow as as some of the interpretations of the Bible we have. We, we're, it is, again, it's this thing about too much information. Now, one of the problems with the Gnostic tradition is that it is is it was set up in contradistinction in opposition to an authoritarian religion so it defined itself in opposition the authoritarian religion defined itself in opposition to the gnostics 
So you have two groups whose over the overarching imperative of their thought was to oppose something. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not in that situation. We're looking for the simple truth. Well, that is very hard to find. And, uh, you know, truth is rare in the world. There, You can get insight from these things, insight. But there's a terrible danger of, well, madness, frankly, and obsession of taking of taking these these any of this literature too seriously, which is why my books are never a presentation of the case. They are an investigation of the subject. And I want people to develop if they want to uh, over time to think about these things for themselves. And I, I, I hope I put enough caveats in to say, you know, don't fly off on this. You know? Right. There are, there, are, there, there are things which you can be enthusiastic about. Sometimes you read a story about a person who's really overcome, you know, a really inspiring story. And it, it's good to, you know, to, to put the lights on that story and inspire people. I do, I do want to inspire it. I'm not writing books to simply fulfill an academic imperative. I, I'd, I'd like the story to inspire, but also uh, to generate a, a mature thoughtfulness. Yeah. Well, I, I think, uh, like I said, I haven't gotten completely through uh, Lost Pillars of Enoch, but as far as I've gotten into it, that's what uh, has, has struck me is that it's it's very, it's it's scholarly and objective. You're not jumping to conclusions about things. Um, you have to, it's all, it, it's inspiring enough that it, you know, it stimulates my, my, uh, my, my questioning center, um, uh, so to speak. Um, and, you know, one other thing I wanted to ask you about, since we're talking about Gnosticism and these different takes on Gnosticism, are you familiar with, uh, and, and we mentioned Robert Anton Wilson, this made me think of this. Are you familiar with uh, Philip, Philip K. Dick, the science fiction writer from the 60s? And yeah, his, yeah. I, I, the only thing I can remember, because I'm I'm not a fiction reader at all. I don't read fiction, and and I'm not it. I'm not terribly inspired by science fiction because there's too little science in it, and too right. much fic, too much too little science and too much fiction. But Philip K. Dick struck me from the bits I've read about him as a really creative writer, and I remember something very valuable. I think he once wrote that the the great revelations are always first discovered at the trash level. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I was thinking of there's there's a book that he wrote called uh, Valis, uh, which stands for it's V-A-L-I-S, Vast Artificial Living Intelligence System, I think is what it stands for. But it's like the main the main character is like going through a a uh, a uh, time loop kind of thing where he is in connection where he lived a past life as a Gnostic in like ancient Rome. And so the, 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 the book, the storyline basically revolves around that as him kind of going back and forth in time and bringing these reflections back to what he saw. And this and then, you know, Philip K., he's writing this in the 60s um, where, you know, he's on the cusp of the counterculture and, you know, uh, you know, protests against Vietnam and very much embedded in, in, in all of that stuff. Um, and I. I just throw that out there because we were talking about Robert Anton Wilson in that time period. And it just made me think about this is another uh, uh, my my personal ideas about Gnosticism are probably a little bit influenced by that. Um, but um, one one of the other things I wanted to ask you is. With an Enoch and um, you might even get into this in the book. What about one of the questions I have about Enoch is John D and another British British uh, alchemist who ended up creating this this language called Enochian. Um, do you have any 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 insights about John D and why he decided well, to call it like language Enochian? He, 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 John D didn't didn't invent the, the language. <clears throat> it was his his scryer, Edward Kelly. Right. Who was a rather dodgy character? Yeah. <laughs> um, D was a was a very foremost mathematician, one of the great mathematicians of Britain and Europe at the time in the late 16th century, 
wrote some very important books. Uh, the math mathematical preface to Euclid was incredibly influential on spreading the idea that mathematics was a useful knowledge for ma for uh, people in all kinds of trades, including mm. architecture, which was uh, surprisingly a novel idea at the time. Mm. Um, and he, but he he also wanted to relate mathematics to astral existence, i.e., uh, related to the geometry of the universe, and. Um, he wrote the Monas Hieroglyphica, which is tremendous work. Now, he kind of exhausted the knowledge basis that was available in the Renaissance but through his like, voluminous reading. I think he had the largest private library in Britain at the time, which was later sacked by a mob, a mob mm -hmm. sent in and they destroyed this fabulous library of rare books. Anyway, um, such is the mob. But. Mm -hmm. um, he wanted to communicate beyond the material level and he knew that he didn't have any psychic abilities himself or didn't believe he had and he was introduced to a man called Edward Kelly who'd already had his ears cropped cut off for, for some felony or other but had a remarkably <laughs> creative mentality and was seriously uh, motivated by alchemy and Edward Kelly um, wormed his way into John Dee's household and made himself useful by basically giving Dee what he wanted, which was communication with the angels. The, at that time, uh, men of learning thought the universe existed on three levels, the terrestrial level, our level, the sublunary level, which was an area of demons and spiritual powers, and then the, uh, the celestial level, which was the power of archangels in touch with the divine being. And he felt that through the knowledge he'd gained, John Dee, that he could understand or deal with the terrestrial and the sublunary level, but he wanted to communicate with the source of all knowledge as he saw it, which is the celestial level. Kelly came along and said, yeah, I can do that. Mm -hmm. And he developed a whole series of tables uh, it called the Liber Log Logaet, and what he called the angelical language. Now, the angelical language was an idea that uh, Dee had already heard about through books published in Europe in the sixth in in his own lifetime, um, which basically gave the idea that there was an original language. There are two original languages: that which Adam spoke when he first names the animals. Nobody knew what that language was. It wasn't Hebrew. And then there's the language that the angels speak. And this language was known to the figure of Enoch because there had been several books, uh, we'd say today, apocryphal books attributed to Enoch. One Enoch, which Jesus would have known about, uh, two Enoch, which was probably written in around the second, third century, and three Enoch, the third book of Enoch, Slavonic Enoch, which is written some centuries later. But in the mythology, Enoch, um, Enoch, which means uh, difficult to know exactly what they meant by, but it seems to be a, a initiated or separated, somebody who has been prepared for a service. It says in Genesis that Enoch lived 365 years, that's no accident, and then he was not, for God took him. In other words, he never died. In the Genesis, Enoch is transported to heaven and lives there. And in third Enoch, he's identified with Metatron, which is a Kabbalistic name for a kind of God sidekick or assistant. And as such, he's running the universe for God, the father. And he, the universe is run in the Enoch, second and third Enoch, like a vast computer to which Enoch has access. Now, uh, Dee knew about this mythology around the figure of Enoch and he wanted to know what this language was because if he understood the divine language then he would understand the essence of science, the super celestial level of mathematics and he would become all-knowing and, and a great value to his queen, Queen Elizabeth I and to the universe and he wanted to solve the religious divisions that had sown mm -hmm. in Europe at that time between Catholic and Protestant which at the time were generating vicious wars as perhaps we're starting to see again I don't know mm -hmm. uh, these terrible religious wars he wanted to find a solution with the divine language now Kelly provided 
the language, which he called the angelical language. It was only later, after D and Kelly, that it was called Enochian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, this language, as is well known, has its own syntax and grammar. A very peculiar uh, combination. My own view is that it comes from a sort of semi-channel, I don't know what, some sort of channeling from uh, Kelly. And, and it's an imaginative language. When you hear it spoken by Alistair Crowley on some interesting wax recordings that still survive, yeah. it's, it's wonderfully effective as a kind of magical incantation. Mm -hmm. um, but in the end, it's still a language. And what, what these angels had to say, which you can read in a book called What Passed for Some Years Between Dr. John D and Some Angels and Some Spirits, Some Spirits. Mm -hmm which is published by Merrick Casorbon uh, in 1659, the end of Oliver Cromwell period, his, his reign as Lord Protector. Uh, the book was actually published to show that Dee was a bad person and in, in league with demons. Uh, but actually, if you read it, which I've given a lot of attention to it, uh, I, I smell Edward Kelly <laughs> all the way through it. Um, yeah, don't you? Because I, I I read I, I read um, that recently in in recent memory, and one of the things I recall there's points where where D like when he's talking he, his 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 notes on it, he'll be saying that he you can tell he's he's skeptical, he's yes. like skeptical about a lot of the things that that Ed Kelly Edward Kelly is saying, and people will Ed say Kelly. like about D, it's like how could he fall for how could he fall for this? And it's like well, you have to understand for one thing. The idea, and, and and I think you just you just said this the i the idea that there's a spirit world and heaven and all this stuff and everything that was just a given during his time period. That wasn't like like it is today. That's compartmentalized as a sort of like a not reality. And then we have material science and like you're saying, everything's like separated now. But in in D's world, it was like that's just a given that there's like a spirit world around us and it's possible to communicate. So his skepticism maybe doesn't seem as strong right as it as it would be today which today would be like hey, you get this guy out of my house you know <laughs> but, but you can understand no he's, he, i think he the really applying the scientific uh, a scientific skepticism to what is considered the science of his day the trouble was of course for poor old d was that the system that he was working with had been devised by kelly and kelly said he'd got it from the angels so who was d to question it uh, right. I think the real giveaway is when the angels suggest that they should share their wives. Yeah, that's when you do. <laughs> so, no, this is BS. I've heard yeah. this before. This is like going to the Hef Hefner mansion, isn't it? <laughs> right. You know, I, because, uh, you know, I think Kelly was one of these very interesting, very intelligent uh, and manipulative people who was probably half convinced himself. I expect he could, he was one of these guys who could get into trances, you know, and it activated a level of his imagination and this material will come out. I mean, Alistair Crowley experimented with what he called the Enochian calls, the Aries, um, and I've read the text and they're, they're fascinating, but I just think it was one Edward Kelly talking to another. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. I think, you know, Crowley claimed Edward Kelly as a precarnation, and uh, I think that's quite good picking on Crowley's part that he didn't but choose <laughs> it didn't choose D he chose Kelly because he knows that Kelly's a bit of a reprobate uh -huh. and Crowley was a bit of a reprobate you know yeah. and I think there was a there was a symbiosis between them um but but Crowley was determined to see what was in it and he, he put a lot of store by his version of the the Enochian. He probably did more to popularize the notion of the Enochian system than anyone else. And I've, um, Lilo Duquette has done an interesting book and said that, you you know, you, you get the CD with the book and you can practice this Enochian magic and you might get somewhere with it. Um, I'd be interested to see how far they get, you know. Right. Uh, I, 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 it, 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 if that's your bag, I mean, there is always the danger with, with all those things of obsession. Um, and you know, uh, self hypnosis, right? You know, and uh, oh, I personally believe in clean mind. <laughs> you know, keep first clean the inside of the cup. I'm not going to take something in to my mind simply because it sounds it's exotically fascinating. Um, I what I want I 
I remember a Rosicrucian leader in Holland said to me, he criticized I was too rational, rationalistic. And I said, mate, that's why I'm still sane. <laughs> 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 you know, let's see where where you get with your irrationality. Right. Uh, I'm not. A, I'm not. I do not believe that reason is any more than a gift of the spirit, but it's some gift if you use yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely. We when you reason, lose it. Yeah. We we have the ability to reason. There's a reason why we have the ability to reason. Um, it's a self self uh, self reflexive self. As, um, as long as we're uh, aiming. As long as it's the truth we want, reason mm -hmm. can convince us of any lie. I'm sure yeah. Putin, in his own mind, is is totally rational. I'm sure that he his logic in his own mind is absolutely faultless. It's just that he completely obliterates the reason of other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So w one one more question that I wanted to ask you about Enoch that I had was was and. and and I can't remember if it's one, two, or three. I've I've read through some of these before, but one of the one of the lines that's always fascinated me a lot is where Enoch talks about seeing a, a crystal palace and seeing and seeing this this fl this flame, this dark fire, um, and and then he sees this dark fire spread over the earth. Do you have any uh, thoughts or or ideas about what that 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 passage might might represent or, or or signify no, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. why would i know such a thing i mean honestly that those books are full of such uh images you know so I mean, do you think that there's anything in the uh book of enoch or those books of enoch that are like related to like what could have been associated with these pillars of enoch as far as like knowledge that might be useful to, to to mankind yeah in the book of enoch um he he gets his son methuselah uh to to communicate some of the wisdom he's found in heaven to mankind and that he should inscribe it in books he says so enoch is interested in getting a a, a bit like uh, d he wants to get some of the heavenly knowledge to guide people on earth so they may overcome the overcome the temptation of false angels or demons who are misleading them and bring them to a closer understanding of cosmic understanding i mean mm -hmm. i think that's a, that's a valid myth today that's mm -hmm. what i that's what any uh, enlightened or would be enlightened scholar and student of reality is trying to do is to bring light into the darkness the, this world is dark of course it is and um, we need illuminated people. There's no doubt of it. Um, but with every illumination, is always a, the, as the tradition informs us, there's always a counterfeit il illumination running alongside it. So I always had the feeling that while I was promoting Gnostic studies, I was also simultaneously encouraging a perverse version of it, which would uh, in, have the opposite effect. Um, and and this is a terrible problem with with initiated knowledge whether to reveal it or who to reveal it to and when and and what mind my own feeling generally about that is that true spiritual knowledge is it's always its own defense um because frankly the evil people don't understand it anyway they may take the words and pervert them but they'll never get to the essence of it so so that's kind of an idea that the uh, like the they say the secrets guard themselves. I think that's very true. Yeah, and sometimes things that you're very familiar with personally can be suddenly closed to you. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a, things that I've seen that became very plain. Sometimes very you don't always get get back there again. Right, and then also when you get into the idea of people guarding secrets or guardians of secrets who keep keep things hidden um this always like ends up going into a um it, it seems to lead somewhere else with people the people who guard the secrets end up there always ends up, ends up being some sort of ethical 
ethical like question that yeah but the real secrets are not what uh, the real secret can never be written that's the joke <laughs> uh -huh. right yeah. that they can't actually guard what the real secret is the real secret there's real, the real secret is an experience yeah the real secret uh, you know it, it you have an experience in your mind of understanding the experience of understanding is not the same as the words that you read that promoted that right so yeah uh, every uh, every key is also l locks the door as well as opens it. Uh -huh. You know, the, people forget yeah. about about the keys of knowledge. Yeah. You know, um, it it the 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 secret so called doesn't mean a thing until it means a thing, and it's the meaning, and that is beyond words. There are no spiritual truths which are uh, can be amplified with words. Real communication is mind to mind and the idea, the, the real mental illumination is not a literal thing at all, which is where Biblicism has always broken down of any kind of Biblicism, I, by which I mean the worship of a book or the worship of the text. This is a holy text. It isn't holy until it does something that illuminates that puts yeah. you in touch with something higher. You know when you're in touch with something higher because you feel low. Yeah. You, know? you don't feel you don't get in touch with something higher and feel high. The real experience of, of, of higher knowledge is humility of realizing how stupid you are. Right. And let, you never learn anything without learning how stupid you are. Yeah. Anyone who people who aggrandize themselves on knowledge haven't learned a thing. Yeah. And that's what it means by the knowledge protects itself. Uh, the people who misuse it ultimately make fools of themselves. They take, of course, they pervert the innocent, you mm -hmm. know, and that's why there's always, you always have to um, have a protective arm around the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Some people are very vulnerable to, to being roped in, you know. I mean, the media does it all the time. I mean, yeah. People no, are roped into something that looks attractive, that sounds true. Yeah. And depending on how desperate they are for this truth, they think sounds right. Depends how much they commit to it. And of course, clever politicians are merely magicians who manipulate right. people, but they don't love people. They don't yeah. care about them. They'll pick them up and drop them. Yeah. Beware, as they say, the proverb, you know, beware, what is it? There have Put not your faith in princes. And that doesn't mean royalty it means people who rule right, beware yeah. be, be wary of those you uh put over yourself it's not a wise thing to put people over yourself anyway yeah. excellent yeah. advice excellent advice so you mentioned uh you, you'd also mentioned um orson wells at the beginning of this would it be fair would it be love fair that man <laughs> love that <laughs> man <laughs> would it be would it be uh, fair to refer to you as the uh, Citizen Kane of Gnosticism? Wow, <laughs> I've been called some things in my time. But that's that's I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Except that Citizen Kane, if I remember the story, was a, was a pretty awful character. <laughs> well, I, no, he started he, out. He started he out good. Spells. He had the best intentions in the world, but then the forces. Uh, the forces of opposition in the world like uh, rallied against him essentially. And, well, uh, and I, if I'm <laughs> if I'm a citizen, Kane, I'm the I kept Rosebud very close. Okay, that's right. Well, you could be a, you're a different kind of citizen, Kane. You could keep your Rosebud with you. You've got your yeah. sleigh in the other room. I have I haven't forgotten. I haven't forgotten where I came from. That's the point. <laughs> Whereas poor old Charlie Kane did forget. And got, <laughs> if you remember, he gets lost in the labyrinth of his own house. Uh -huh. And the, for the scene with the, Susan's with the big jigsaw and he calls her and the echo of his voice, she can't hear him uh -huh. because the house is so big when he speaks to her, she can't hear. It's very yeah. interesting. Lovely yeah. scene. No, actually, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm an amateur filmmaker, too. I took a minor in film studies and, and when I was in a university. And so I, 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 I so I watch. I watch Citizen Kane a lot. And, and, what's and your favorite? What's your favorite Orson Welles film? Um, well, Citizen Kane is up there. Um, I like his, uh, his, his Macbeth. 
um i i i like a lot i think that's one of the the best versions of it all the most recent version of Macbeth that came out um is is uh with uh, yeah, denzel washington is is pretty good um but i i like that one i also like his um what is it, is it the the stranger mm. yeah where he's fascinating he's film that, yeah. A, 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 a Nazi war criminal that's like, you know, trying to live undercover and, and uh, one he keeps as, as he has to cover up each thing, each person who finds out his secret, he has to get rid of more and more people. So it's this endless cycle. Um, mm. yeah. A bit like a bit like Mr. Arcadin, which I'm very fond of that film, even though it was mutilated by other editors. I think I love Mr. Arcadin, if you know that one. Made no, I do not. Uh, he made it in Europe, uh, all over Europe, in the in the mid fifties, and okay. uh, it's also about a man trying to destroy his own past because he can't face up to it. Very, yes. it's a very strong theme in his films. I, my favorite Wells movie is Chimes at Midnight. Okay, uh, I have not it, seen that one either. I'm going to have to check that out. Beautiful film. It, I think it was Wells's personal favorite as well. Okay. Now, did you see recently there was a release of Orson Welles' last film? Yes, I was very sad to watch that. Didn't, uh, didn't do it for you? No, I watched it twice in the hope that I must have missed something the first time. Uh -huh. I, think, I think it has a lot of problems with the production, and I admire the people who've tried to reconstitute it. I, right. think, there's a lot, I think there's a lot to be said for the idea that maybe... He w I don't think he would have let the film out in that condition. Yeah. I think I think it was a great mistake to I think the the, the, the initial commentary which uh, Bogdanovich Peter Bogdanovich reads should have been read by an actor who could do Wells's voice because you need the Wells voice to set the yeah. thing going. I, you really do. Yeah. And Peter Bogdanovich, I think, was a great mistake to have him as an actor in the film. I think he's useless in the film. He doesn't. He's not an actor. He was a director. Um, Wells was very had lost his main actor. The, he'd shot all the scenes with Bogdanovich already, and then the actor left, left him, and said, "I can't stick with your production anymore." And he said, "But I only need so many scenes of you." He said, "No," and he went off. And so yeah. he had to reshoot them all with Bogdanovich, who at the time was putting him up in his house. So the film was made under ridiculous circumstances. Um, I also think the, that John Huston, um, you know, doesn't work as Hannaford. I think Orson Welles should have played the part himself. I also think the film is filled with too much of Welles's personal bitterness about Hollywood. Yeah, which is, def that's definitely true. It's, a, it's really a satire. It's oh. a satire. And I think Welles was above satire. Uh -huh. And I, th I think it's, I would hate to think everyone, anyone thought that was like, you know, the great lost movie. I, I don't think so. I think it was a, a record of one of the worst periods of his life when he was desperately trying to get a foothold back in Hollywood and yeah. just couldn't get anywhere. And that frustration is in every frame. Yeah. Oh, the film is filled with brilliant ideas. And Gary Craver's photography, especially the scenes with Oya Kadar, uh, are magically done, and it's a great piss take out of Zabriskie Point. Uh -huh. Anto it's very much aimed at Antonioni and um, the new the new wave of Hollywood. You know, particularly uh -huh. Dennis Hopper. You know, yeah. I think yeah. it's got all that in it. It's brilliantly clever, but uh -huh. ultimately very disappointing. Yeah, uh, I, and I almost wish it, almost almost wish it hadn't come out, especially in that in that form and i'm sure wells's editing would have been considerably having oh, seen f f fake wells was the greatest editor who ever lived in my opinion uh -huh. he was as great an editor as he was any anything else he did uh -huh. and uh, uh it doesn't work and i'm sure he wouldn't have let it out like that yeah that's well, my feeling <laughs> amazing amazing food for thought there um well uh Tobias, I gotta tell you, I've enjoyed this conversation so much. Uh, I'm so glad we got a chance to talk here. And you know, we only like hit like maybe 20 percent of the things that I wrote down because we ended up going into much more uh, interesting uh, territory. So 
uh, maybe someday you can come back on the show and we can talk about Aleister Crowley at America, Awakening of the Individual Mind. You know, I was going to ask you some thoughts about, you know, other things, uh, you know, uh, Abby at the Lima and stuff like that. But uh, what about next year? This time next, next year. year? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because I'll have yeah. a new Crow I'll have a new Crowley book out then. Which oh, been, OK. Yeah, yeah. That's what's new, coming up next. Crowley it's book. my it's the last volume, the last volume of my Crowley biography, volume six. And it's it's my favorite. I think it's the best of the lot. Okay. And uh, that'll be out uh, in January or De December of this year or January. So let's okay. do it. Let's do it again when that comes out. OK, no, that sounds like an ex what's and the then name we'll do it. Then we'll do a Crowley show. OK, we'll do a Crowley show. Uh, what's the name of the book going to be? It's going to be. Uh, yeah, it's going to be called Alistair Crowley in Paris. In Paris. Oh, OK, in Paris. OK. So you did. I know you've done uh, in America, in England. You're going to do in Paris. And th is there more before that that I was? Yeah, there aware? was also uh, Alice Crowley in India and Alice Crowley in Berlin. Oh, okay. Now that is so unique. So you you've done that's a unique take on Crowley to split yeah. him up in, in in terms of where he was at the time, and that probably also like uh, gives great insights into the. Uh, the political things, the things that were going on in the world around him at the time period, have a I, I think have to have a tremendous influence on what what was going on at the time. So, very much so. I, I think people talk about Crowley as if he lived in a, a, a bubble with no rel relation to the the real reality of, of of the time. No, he was he was in touch. He was very in touch. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh yeah, yeah. I think that's true. Excellent. Well, hey, thank you so much for taking time to do this, uh, Tobias. Um, do you have any any final words for us? Yes, I mean, uh, keep keep reading the books and and keep enjoying the subjects we talk about, and don't let them weigh too heavily on you. All right. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, uh, my friend, and uh, keep fighting the good fight. Will do. Bye, bye, Paul. Bye, bye.